Today is Palm Sunday. And I will admit to you on the front end that I'm going to preach a Palm Sunday message in a way like I have never preached a Palm Sunday message. And that's one reason that I wanted to show that opening to you as we get into the Word of God today, because what I'm going to say to you is probably not what you're going to expect. But I really feel like this is what we need to talk about on this Palm Sunday. And I pray that what you will do is open your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you, because I believe today is the day that everything the enemy has launched against you is going to be destroyed once and for all through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every, every tactic that the enemy has meant to destroy your home, your marriage, your children, your health, your employment, your job, everything, I believe in the name of Jesus is going to be destroyed today because of the power that is in that name. Who can agree with me on that? That's why I'm preaching what I'm preaching. So it is Palm Sunday. And so with that, I invite you to go with me to the text that describes this glorious moment in which Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And that is in the 21st chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 21. Now, we are going to go three different places today. Matthew 21, as you stand together for the reading of God's word. Matthew 21, Zechariah chapter number 9, and then John chapter number 1. Matthew 21, Zechariah chapter 9, and then John chapter number 1. I'm reading these three, and in just a moment, you're going to see how they tie together because on the surface, they don't really go together, but I'm going to show you how. Matthew 21, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number eight. Verse number, no, no, let's go ahead and read verse number six. Let's start there. Matthew 21, verse six. If you have it, say amen. So the disciples, they went and they did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the multitude who went before and those who followed, they cried out and they said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Everybody shout Hosanna. Hosanna. Mm, how many believe he's worthy of praise this morning? Hosanna. Now go to Zechariah chapter number nine. Zechariah is at the end of the Old Testament, right before the book of Malachi. Zechariah chapter number nine. And this is a prophecy fulfilling what I just read. Zechariah, the prophet, centuries before, said in verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, go to John chapter number one. John chapter number one. And I'm going to read one verse. John chapter one, verse number 29. The fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Today being Palm Sunday... Pastors are supposed to preach from the Palm Sunday text and lead you into a glorious revelation of what that day must have been like. And I will do that to a certain extent, 
But as you look at this text, I have to imagine that the emotion of that day must have been powerful. I must imagine that the shout and the adoration of those people that welcomed Jesus who was riding into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey must have been ecstatic, must have been at a very, very high level. The shouts that were, that were ushered as Jesus came riding in, as they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And many times what we do is we take that text and we preach out of that text about praise and we te uh, teach out of that text about worship. And I think we can all agree this morning that Jesus is worthy of our worship. Can we get an agreement on that? Shout amen. We can all agree that he is king. In fact, not only is he king, he's king of all kings and he's Lord of all lords. How many believe that? Can you shout amen? Amen. And so as we look at the text, the natural inclination is for us to go that direction and we shout Hosanna and we shout praise and we shout worship. But if, if I may, if I may ask you a, a real simple question about why these people were actually in Jerusalem at the moment that Jesus came riding in on the colt of a donkey. Why were there so many people in Jerusalem? Well, the answer to that is very simple. They were there to celebrate Passover. In fact, one census said that they're at an annual Passover, which is the most continuous and oldest feast that the Jewish people celebrate, that 256,000 lambs were slain, killed during Passover. And the Jews would eat of the lamb to celebrate that moment in which God delivered them out of Egypt and they were delivered out of bondage. Now, each lamb would feed about 10 people. So you mathematicians that are in the room, quickly in your head, you're doing the math. That means that it's about 2,700,000 people that are crammed into the city of Jerusalem for Passover. That's a lot of people. They are there to celebrate the deliverance of God, of the Israelites out of Egypt. They are there ready to go eat of the sacrificial lamb of Passover. And then all of a sudden, in comes riding Jesus on the colt of a donkey. And they begin to cry out, Hosanna. Now, Hosanna is a simple word that means save us. Save us. And they take palm branches, the Bible said, and they wave palm branches and they uh, line the streets with palm branches. Palm branches uh, is a symbol of Israeli or Jewish nationalism. And so basically, these people, as they lay palm branches and cry out, save us, are welcoming Jesus as their Messiah, not in the spiritual sense, but rather in the political sense. Because now, can you give me just a few moments to lay the groundwork for you today? They are shouting Hosanna because they are oppressed by Rome. They are under the tyrannical thumb of Rome. And so they think that this is the fulfillment of Zechariah, where he is their political king that is going to deliver them from Rome and set up the Jewish kingdom. And so they are crying out to him as their Messiah in that sense. And you say, Pastor, why would you say that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if you fast forward just a few days, the same crowd that cried out Hosanna a few days later, we're crying out, crucify him. The same crowd that seemingly laid down the palm branches was crying out for Barabbas. Because you see, they missed the reason that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. He was not coming in to set up a kingdom, but rather he was coming in to fulfill the Passover feast as the spotless lamb of almighty God. And I wonder sometimes, my friend, if we miss what this is all about, where we laud him as a political Messiah rather than the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world.
And so today, I guess my question is this, which of the two cries was the most accurate? Was it John's cry that said, behold the Lamb of God, or was it the cry of a mass that was wanting political deliverance, amen, that said, Hosanna? And I want to present to you on this Palm Sunday that I feel like the reason Jesus came into Jerusalem, amen, was to fulfill that perfect plan of God to be slain, to be killed, and his blood to be shed so you and I could be saved and redeemed and healed in Jesus' name. How many are glad for that? Let me hear you shout amen. And so today on this Palm Sunday, amen, I am simply saying that I want to recognize Jesus as the Lamb of God. Now, When you look at Passover, Passover, I've already said, is the oldest and most continuously celebrated feast of the Jewish people. And it is one that dates back over 3,500 years. In fact, really, there's only one Passover. That one Passover was in Egypt when God told Moses that they were to slay a firstborn lamb, put the blood on the doorpost of their house, and as the death angel would come through, every door that had the blood of the lamb on uh, would be would be spared. Their firstborn would not be killed, and every door that did not have the blood, the firstborn of that household would be killed. It was a plague on the Egyptians, on the enemies of God. And so they put the blood, and the death angel passed over that that house. And from that time, the Jews every year would celebrate the Passover. But as you look at this, look in your Bible, if you will, for just a moment, that this is only a one-time thing. Happened only once. Everything after that is a celebration and a commemoration of what happened on that first Passover. And so if we are talking about Jesus as a Passover lamb, how many know there's only been one one time that the Lamb of God needed to be slain, and there was only one time that his blood needed to be shed. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18 that Christ hath once, everybody say once, suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Hebrews 7 and verse 20. Paul said, who needs not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sin and then for the people's. For this he did how many times? Once when he offered up himself. My friend, I want to tell you something this morning. Jesus has done absolutely everything that needs to be done for you to be saved, for you to be healed, for you to be delivered, and for you to walk in every blessing that has been promised in the word of Almighty God. It has already been done, and the Lord doesn't need to do anything else for you to receive what you need from God. How many know what I'm talking about? Can I get a witness? Somebody shout amen. How many know he doesn't need to come and die for your sins again? He doesn't need to come and take 39 more stripes on his back for you to be healed again. He doesn't need to come and have them spit in his face for you to be delivered again. I want you to know that the moment Jesus went to the cross, hear me on this, everything that you need from God, redemption, health, amen, deliverance, peace of mind, peace of heart, amen, blessing and prosperity, everything was done in the moment that Jesus died, and the only thing left is for you and I to recognize it's up to me by faith to say, Lord, you've done it all, and now I'm walking into the covenant that you provided through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Do you believe it? Shout amen. Glory to God. (laughs) Amen. I came into this service, and I'm believing that somebody is going to get healed in the middle of my preaching. Somebody is going to get healed in the middle of my preaching. You say, Pastor, you don't do it that way. Yes, I'm not doing the healing. God is. And I'm giving you the word of God. And I'm telling you, you don't need to wait five more minutes to get healed in Jesus' name. The stripes have already been taken. He's already been beaten. And now, Lord, I accept what you did. And I receive my healing in the name of Jesus. There it goes. Every virus, everything the devil has brought against your body in the name of Jesus. He's done it already. Receive it in Jesus' name. 
And I know tradition says you wait till the end of the preaching, come down to the altar, then you're delivered. Let me tell you something. There's more power in this word. I said there's more power in this word. And this word said, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Amen. He was taken as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Amen. He, amen, was oppressed. He was afflicted. And with his stripes, we are healed. That is the word. You take hold of the word and you'll receive your healing in Jesus' name. Amen. It's already done. Look at somebody say, it's already done. It's already done. So here he comes riding into Jerusalem, not as a king, but as a lamb. A lamb that they missed. They didn't understand. They thought their lamb was back home. They thought their lamb would be celebrated later, and they were looking at the lamb of God. You say, Pastor Hal, do we know he is the Lamb of God? Well, when you look back at the first Passover, Exodus chapter number 12, you will find that the Lord told the Israelites that in the 10th day of the month, they were to take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And number one, verse five the lamb will be without blemish, a male of the first year. You will take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And so number one, the lamb was spotless and the lamb was perfect. Verse six, the Bible said, you will keep it till the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will kill it in the evening. So they took the lamb into the house on the 10th day of Nisan and observed it for four days until the 14th day. They observed this male lamb so they would know that it was without blemish and that it was perfect. Also, they observed it because this lamb literally became a part of the family. He was like a pet. Okay, for four days, they had the lamb in the house. And then on the 14th day, they were to take that lamb and they were to slay that lamb and put the blood of that lamb on the door post. You know why we celebrate Jesus as our Passover lamb? Because he is the only one that has ever lived that is perfect and without sin. He is without blemish. No other religious leader, amen, could ever measure his sinlessness or his perfection. Amen. The Bible said this in 1 Peter chapter number 1. I'm going to give you a lot of word today. Verse number 19, Peter said, he said, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter number 2, who did no sin and need Neither was guile found in his mouth. I want to tell you something this morning. The reason I know you can be healed today and you can be saved today and you can be delivered is because the Savior that we serve lived a sinless, perfect, flawless life. Amen. And there was no blemish in him. There was no mistake in him. And the blood that he shed was a sinless blood. Amen. Able to redeem you from absolutely any sin that you have ever committed. Come on, somebody. Can you just thank God that he is the spotless lamb of almighty God. No other religious leader can claim that. Now, Paul said this, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 21. He said, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, the order of these words in the original Greek is much more emphatic. Basically, it says, him that knew no sin, he made sin for us. And what that does is assert the absolute sinlessness of Jesus. It asserts the fact, amen, that there was, but because of his sinlessness, that qualified him to actually become sin for you. Now, let me clarify something. Jesus was not a sinner. 
Some people interpret that and say, look, he became a sinner. No, he did not become a sin, a sinner, but rather took, amen, the enormity of the weight of the sin of the world upon himself. And that's why God the Father turned his face away and Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Amen. The fact of the matter is Jesus took that sin on himself, amen, not just, amen, and so you and I could come as sinners, but he didn't just forgive you of your sin. He literally broke the power of sin by becoming sin for you. Galatians 3, look at this. The Bible said Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Romans chapter 8, verse number 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. My friend, I want, to, I want you to know something this morning. When Jesus went to the cross, he went not just to forgive you. He went so that you no longer had to live under the power of sin for one more day of your life. Oh, come on. Let me deal with this right now. Because you know what we're doing? We're living in a day when we say, well, you know what? We all sin every day. We all sin. Every no, we don't. I believe the Lord because there's people in this room right now that say, Pastor, I just can't break the power of lust. I can't break the power of sin. I can't break the power of depression. I can't break the power of anxiety. I just can't do it anymore. Let me tell you something right now. By the blood of Jesus, amen, he is able to break that power that is in your life. And in the name of Jesus, I want you to know that when you look at the cross, he broke the power of sin and you can be free right now in the name of Jesus Every chain can be broken. Why? Because he became that for you. Do you believe it? Shout amen. He became sin. Why? So that you could become the righteousness of God. So no power. Let me tell you something. There is no power of the world that has to dominate your mind. There is no power of the devil that has to dominate your emotions. And you know what? I'm just going to break it right now because there's a bunch of people running around saying, well, you know what? And no, 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 no. We are as the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're living above sin. We're not, I know, understand. I'm not saying that we're never going to sin in life. We all make mistakes. But what I'm saying, there is a power that is greater than any power of anybody in this world that can cause you to live a life of victory every single day and you can rise above Above what the devil said that you are. Why? Because he became sin for you. Do you believe it? Shout amen. Hallelujah. So the lamb was sinless. Now, look in verse 46. In one house will it be eaten. You will not carry forth out of the flesh abroad, out of the house, and neither will you break a bone thereof. Not only was the lamb sinless, not only was the lamb perfect and flawless, but there were no bones in the lamb that were to be broken. The psalmist prophesied like this in Psalm 34. Speaking of the Messiah, he keepeth all his bones and not one of them is broken. So when you look at the actual crucifixion of Jesus in John chapter number 19 and verse 32, the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first thief who had died with him and of the other thief which were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, verse 33, and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. For in verse 36, these things were done that the scripture would be fulfilled a bone of him would not be broken. Now, <clears throat> let me deal with this. Why is it that it was prophesied that the Lamb of God would not have a bone to be broken? And then why is it when Jesus died that they broke the legs of the first two thieves, but to fulfill prophecy would not break the legs of the Son of God? Could it be that this is a fulfillment of Jesus as the second Adam. 
You say, Pastor, why would you say that? Well, go back to the first Adam. Adam, living in perfection, living in paradise, the Bible said God looked at Adam and said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'm going to make a help meet for him. Now, where did God take the help meet? Where did God take the woman? He took the woman out of the side of Adam. What is it that Adam said about Eve? He said, she is bone of my bone. She is flesh of my flesh. Now, a rib was taken out of the side of Adam, but a bone was not broken. In other words, Adam remained whole, and out of that came his bride, came his helpmeet. And so Eve was created out of Adam's wholeness. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I have, I have read that actually a rib, that is the one bone that if, that if doctors are very careful not to damage the connective tissue, that they can take a bone, uh, kind of a bone specimen or a bone graft out of the rib because the rib will grow back. And so, aren't you glad God knows what he's doing? He took a rib out of Adam, and Adam said, this now is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now, look in Second Corinthians, or Ephesians chapter 5. I find it interesting in Ephesians 5 and verse number 25, where he said, husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Gave himself for it. All you women should have said amen on that. That wasn't strong enough. <laughs> that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot, not having wrinkle, or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man yet ever hated his flesh, but he nourisheth it and he cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So now, basically, what God is doing is comparing now, of course, the relationship of Adam and Eve, husband and wife, to the relationship of Jesus and the church. And just as Eve was taken out of the side of Adam without a bone being broken, so we now are taken out, amen, of Christ and we have become his body. Because look in the next verse, in verse number 30. The Bible said that we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Look at that. Keep that verse up there. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So when Jesus, in the Last Supper, was talking to the disciples, he said, here, take, eat. This is my body, which is what? Broken for you. His bones, amen, were not broken so that you and I, as his bride, could remain and be whole in Jesus' name. Let me tell you something, Raul, my God, I'm preaching to somebody right now. Amen. I know we go through things in life, amen, that break us, break us mentally break us emotionally, relationships break up, things are broken in this world. How many know we live in a broken world right now? We live in a, in a, a, a politically broken world. Have you watched the news recently? We live in a socially broken world. Get on Instagram and you'll find out how broken it really is. We live in a world, amen, where homes are broken, minds are broken, bodies are broken. But I'm going to stand in front of you as your spiritual shepherd today. And I'm going to declare unto you that not one bone of the Lord Jesus Christ was broken. And the reason is, is because he wants his church not to be a broken church, but to be a church, amen, that is glorious and a church that is victorious and a church that is rising. Amen. We are not broken, we are made whole in the name of Jesus, and I believe that today it is happening on this Palm Sunday. How many can receive that in Jesus' name? Shout amen. Glory to God. Churches are not to split. 
They are not to divide. They are not to be broken. I don't care what you think. I believe the church ought to be growing. The church ought to be thriving. And that's why this church is alive by the power of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to continue to grow. You know why? Because we've been made whole by the Son of God. And you're in a place right now, you, no matter what you have been through in life, how many believe you can be healed and made whole right now? Glory to God. Let me just say this. You're not broken even by the mistakes you've made. And I know people say, well, you know what? Based on what she did, based on what he did, no, it's no wonder her life is broken. Let me tell you something. That's a lie out of the pit of hell. I said, that is, a, I am not broken because of the mistakes I've made. You are not, oh God, am I talking to somebody right now? I said, you are not broken because of the mistakes uh, that you've made. You say, pastor, I was on drugs, though. my mind is broken. No, your mind is healed in the name of Jesus. Uh, amen, I've made mistakes, my home is broken. No, your home is healed in the, oh, I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm preaching the word of God to let you know you've got to stop looking at yourself as a broken piece uh, and you've got to realize that those bones of him, uh, they were not broken so that you could accept your wholeness today. Your mind can be whole in the name of Jesus. You are not broken. You are whole. Somebody shout amen. Look at somebody say, I'm whole. I'm whole. I'm whole. Right now. Right now. Glory to God. Not one bone was broken. He was spotless. He was flawless. But thirdly, go back to Exodus 12 and verse 13. The blood will be to you for a token upon the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague will not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The lamb provided redemption through the blood. Church, the reason that I celebrate the lamb of God today is because I know that through his blood, I have been redeemed. And through his blood, there is no plague of the world of Egypt that is going to come upon me. I don't know where you are this morning, but I'm leading hundreds of people from this point out of this Egypt-based mindset that we are still under the plague of this world and under the curse of this world. And I'm leading hundreds of people into a promised land that said the blood has caused me to be redeemed from every sin and every sickness and every plague and every attack of the enemy. And I'm not going to anymore talk like the world talks. I'm going to talk like I am under the blood of the Lamb of God. I'm not going to talk about the sin that I committed 10 years ago. I'm not going to talk about the sin that I committed even just yesterday. I'm not going to talk about the effects of the sin of my childhood. I'm going to talk about the blood that has redeemed me from that sin. Because when the blood is applied to my life, in God's sight, it is just as if you had never sinned. Oh, my God, help me for just one moment. I said it is just as if you had never sinned. When you are justified, the only thing that God sees is the blood. That death angel in Egypt when he was coming through, and going from house to house, you know what? He didn't knock on the door and go into the house and interview the dad of the house and say, okay, I need to know your family history. I need to know what you have done. I need to know what you did 20 years ago. And based on that, you might be spared. Is that what he did? 
The only thing the death angel looked for was the blood on the door of the house. That's the only thing he looked for. And when he saw the blood, he said, I'm passing over this house. I don't care who's in it. I don't care the family history or the dynamics. I don't care if dad's been a mess. He's got the blood on the door of his house. And I'm passing over and life is going, my God, I'm about to shout right now. My Lord, the only thing God is looking for is the blood of the lamb on your life. He's not looking at your history He's not looking at what you did. He's looking to see, have you put it under the blood? And God is passing over. Judgment is no longer there. Condemnation is no longer there. Guilt is no longer there. Shame is no longer there. Why? Because you are under the blood. Somebody shout amen. Oh, come on. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right now, right now, right now. Glory to God. Ha, <laughs> ha, ah, yeah. The Lord is setting you free right now. He's setting you free of the mindset uh, that you're a sinner. You're not a sinner. You're under the blood of Jesus. Uh, he's setting you free from the mindset that you're an ex-alcoholic. That's a lie. You're not an ex-alcoholic. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You're a saint of Almighty God. You're a king and a priest under God. He doesn't care how many times you got drunk when you were 17. It's under the blood. He doesn't even remember it. I said, he doesn't even remember it. So why do you keep bringing it up? Why do you keep talking about it? Why do you keep acting as if, no, 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 no. God said, as far as the east is from the west. <laughs> as far as the east is from the west. So far hath he removed our transgressions from us. I'm talking to somebody. The devil has been browbeating you over the things that you've done and I'm telling you it is under the blood and all God is looking for is the blood applied. If the blood is applied, you are redeemed. You are set free. You are not that woman and you are not that man. You are a different child of the king and all things have been made new. Why? Because of of the blood. Somebody shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's why I love singing about the blood. That's why I love talking about the blood. And there's, there's nothing against some of the worship songs that are out there today, but I'm going to tell you something. We need more songs about the blood of Jesus. We need more songs about the cross. And I know the excuse is, well, you can't attract people that way. Let me tell you something. I know to the world it's foolishness. Amen. But to we who are called... <sighs> Preaching of the cross may be foolish to them, but to us it is the power of God unto salvation. And I want to tell you something, I'm going to preach the cross because, oh my God, new age thinking is not going to set you free. I can give you all kinds of philosophy on how to save time and become a better wife or a better husband, but it's only the cross that is going to deliver you. And today, if you will come to the cross, he will wipe it all away through the blood, through the blood. Through the blood. Glory to God. Hallelujah. John had it right when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And on this Palm Sunday, this may not be what you came to hear, but when we say, Behold, the Lamb of God, then we have a right to say, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But we can't call him king until we first call him the lamb. 